Yeah, so look, um, I, I do expect good work, you know, just like the hydrogen atom. Those problems were crap, all right? It's not good enough to be a physics major and not do these right. Okay? You gotta be able to get through it. So do these well. The batch count rule will take a curl of this, all right, and use the batch count rule. So you've got the curl, the curl of Eaton. I'm going to do this times equals minus d by dt of the curl of b. Okay, the curl of b, we can read over here, is minus d by dt of mu zero epsilon naught de dt. And there's no excuses for me not to be able to follow your work. I mean, most of the work is all over. There's bits here, there's bits here, there's bits here, there's bits here, there's bits here. It should flow. It should flow like a paper. All right, I shouldn't have to work so hard to try to follow what your logic is, All right? All right, and here's the deal. If in your homework, your work is all over the place, but you got the right answer, you're not done. Do it again so that it flows nicely and it's in a good way, All right? So this is how I would do it. Then what I would say is I would recall the back count rule, which is A cross B cross C equals B times A dot C minus uh, C times A dot B. All right, so right below here, so that I can see what I'm doing, I'm going to do it. So this is uh, the, the divergence of A dot C, so del dot E minus um, C, which is E times del dot uh, del. Right for Maxwell's equations, this is zero. Okay, this is minus e. What is del dot del? Is that a scalar or a vector? Scalar. scalar. It's a scalar. So if it's a scalar, you can slide it in front. All right. So this is del squared e equals minus mu naught epsilon naught d squared e d t squared. Okay. Okay. So it should not. No one's homework should have looked like more than that. All right. All right. And if it didn't look like that, if it was all over the place, then that means you don't have a good enough handle on the material. All right. And so what happens is if you go through and you get it, but it's all over the place and a mess, and you, you scribble things out and everything, put it away and do it again. Do it again until you can do it on the board like I did it. All right. Isn't it the parentheses are on B cross C on the top? On the top left, a, a cross B cross C. Don't you have to do B cross C first for the whole uh, to work? Right here? Yeah. I, I don't think so. I think it's cumulative, but I don't know for sure. Pretty sure it's cumulative, right? Cumulative, cumulative or associative. It's associative. I know there's three names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those names. All right. It's like Feynman said. So Feynman said, it doesn't matter if you, whether or not you know the name, you ma it matters whether or not you know what it is and you can do it. All right. But that's an excuse. I should know the name of those three. The cumulative is, uh, is maybe the cumulative it's addition. Cumulative and distributed. Yeah. Okay. So that was the first part. Then the second part, as I said, in one dimension, show that the plane wave solution is indeed a solution. Uh, so the claim is uh, u not epsilon not t squared, or partial squared e with respect to t squared. Okay, and so the solutions are, the solutions are e of x and e equal plane waves, e to the um, i k, oh, sorry, e to the i k x minus omega t. All right, so if I claim um, x plus 2 equals 4, that the answer is x equals 2, how do I see if it's, re if it's right? Throw it back in. I throw it back in. All right, and so what you want to do is you want to take this answer and throw it back in. All right, and um, so just, just a quick thing. Yep. So you just went, you took Maxwell's equations, and then you... Apply the curl, the curl to E mm -hmm. to get the wave equation mm -hmm. and show that it, it's equivalent essentially. No, I, I got the wave equation. My claim is that this is an answer. Oh, or no, you got the wave equation. Yeah. Show that that's equivalent. 
That's, yeah, great. Yeah. Now I was going to go over there and say, okay, then you state that that's a solution. Right. So now let's see if it works. Right. Just like how like, in differential equations we guess answers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and I always remember a good guess is e to the something. Because it's true. Because what you do is you guess e to the something. And then you figure out what that something needs to be to make the equation work. Right? And if the equation comes out to be a real number, well, it's a real number, but if it comes out to be a complex number, then you kind of need a vector solution. So e to the something encompasses you know, scalar numbers and vectors all at once. And so it's a great general guess. So your theory, your whole, your whole motivation in, uh, in differential equations is to guess with something that, that is so general that you can force it to work somehow. Now, they don't like to tell you that if you use very specific <laughs> methods of what you have to do. Right? So yeah, now we're going to plug it in. And by all means, don't switch it back. I mean, exponentials are wonderful to work with. They're easy to differentiate. They're easy to integrate. It's why when we have hard problems, we elevate things to the complex plane. Because once they're complex, you can make them into exponentials. Then once they're exponentials, all you have to do is differentiate and integrate them with the exponentials. That's fine. And then when you're all done, then convert them back into real and imaginary parts. And lo and behold, the real and imaginary parts of a, a complex number are linearly independent. So both parts are a solution. So you solve two solutions at, at once using exponentials that are way easier. All right? So just throw them in. So the second derivative of this is going to be, let's see, it's going to be uh, i squared k squared e0, e i, k, x, minus omega t. And then over here, it's going to be mu naught, epsilon naught. The second row is going to be, uh, <coughs> oh, it's going to be minus i squared omega squared, e0, e to the i, k, x, minus omega t. This stuff cancels out. The i's cancel out. This becomes positive. So essentially, we have k squared over omega squared equals mu naught epsilon naught. Uh, then you have to remember the k is 2 pi over lambda. Uh, omega is 2 pi over the period. So k squared over omega squared squared equals, uh, yeah, it's 1 over velocity squared, I think. Right. 1 over velocity squared, and that equals mu zero epsilon naught. So this is true. So this equation, this solution is the answer to this equation. If it's true that 1 over b squared equals mu naught epsilon naught, and we know that's the case, that's the speed of light. Yeah, yeah. So this is true. It, it's a true, it's a, it's a good solution for things that go the speed of light. That's it. Okay, so that's what this homework was about. Right? Um, and so look, guys, uh, I want you to be comfortable with things. And being comfortable with things means you can do it on your own and other people can follow it easily. All right? Okay, so let's move on. Right. And we had, in the last class, derived the Schrodinger equation. Yeah. All right. We started off with Maxwell's equations, made the connection between Maxwell's equations for light that's a wave, but also act like a particle. Then we started looking at the experiments in the 1900s with an electron. And the electron was definitely a particle, but now all of a sudden it had very wave-like properties. In addition, it had a wavelength from de Broglie. So then the question was to go out and find a wavelength. How did we go out and find a wavelength? Well, we looked for a wave equation. Right? And our, our uh, guiding force for the wave equation was Maxwell's equations. So when we took a deeper look at Maxwell's equations, it looked like an energy eigenvalue problem, where on one side it was the total relativistic energy squared as if it was a particle. And on the other side, it was the total relativistic energy of his wave. Right? So you try that, and you put in a mass term. Right? And what Schrodinger did is when he put in a mass term, he got all types of difficulties. He got negative probabilities, and he got negative energies. That's bad. Right? So when he looked at that, that eigenvalue equation, it was a total energy squared. 
So quadratic equation. So what he did is he went to the linear case, right? And then that didn't help much when he did the linear relativistic energy because it's still, for the particle part of that, it still had to do with the square root. So what he did is he abandoned that and then just went to the linear um, non-relativistic energy and that's Schrodinger's equation. And that's where we left off. Okay? So everybody needs to know that story. What's that? Okay, good. Just <laughs> and that was time dependent? That was a um, time dependent equation, yes. Okay? Okay, so here's where we left off. We had this kind of funky eigenvalue equation. <coughs> e non relativistic. Non-relativistic as if particle times psi equals I H partial with respect to T times psi. Where this stuff, what did that pull out? That's the operator for okay, it's kind of like E total as if waiting. So maybe I should have written it this way first. Let me let me erase that guys and write it this way. This is this is clearer, more consistent with my argument. E total as if weighing psi. <coughs> Alright, and so what we did is we came down here and we said something like EK, if you're a particle, you have kinetic energy and you have potential energy. And if your wave, your total energy is h bar omega, so we, we found the operator to pull out h bar omega, and that was um, i h partial with respect to t of psi. Alright, remember that e k is p squared over uh, 2m, and we call the potential energy operator, whatever the potential is, v, we talked about the confusion by using v, v stands for what? Potential energy. Potential energy. And what units does it have? Joules. Or Joules, yeah. It's not, but it's very definitely not a voltage, all right? Yeah. Okay, so some, if you want, you used to writing a U for potential energy, that's fine. And we also talked about the operator for P squared to the operator for linear momentum. We found it was IH minus IH partial with respect to X. Okay, so this all becomes minus H R squared over 2M. Um, Partial with respect to x squared plus v times psi equals i h partial with respect to t of psi. And indeed, that is Schrodinger's time dependent wave equation. Yeah, the linear, that's the linear time dependent <coughs> Excuse me? That's the linear time dependent wave equation. Well, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a second order um, differential equation, all right? But it didn't have that quadratic term that we got when we started off from Maxwell's equation. When we started off with Maxwell's equation, this was squared and that was squared. And that's where Schrodinger ran into all those problems. Okay, but remember, I told you all those problems were later rectified and understood. Right? Okay, so that's where we're at. All right, uh, then my next claim is um, when you go to solve problems, that really the only thing that changes problem to problem is what? Potential. It's potential energy. All right, so the, the, the functional form of the operator for kinetic energy never changes. And so what really just changes problem to problem is the potential. All right, so when instead, now when we start a problem in quantum mechanics, instead of going sum of the forces equals ma, which is your starting point for classical physics and Newtonian physics, what you do is you simply write down Schrodinger's equation. Then your next goal is to draw a nice picture. And from your nice picture, look and find out what the potential energy looks like. Okay? But what we're going to do next um, now is we're going to look at um, uh, the next aspect of this which is the statistical interpretation of uh, the wave function. Okay, so 
Uh, it's Born's statistical interpretation of the wave function, and I want you to spend some.